Hello, in this video, we're going to be looking at Wi-Fi fundamentals. There are eight different sections that we're going to cover. First is Wi-Fi introduction. The second is radio frequency bands. The third is Wi-Fi standards. And then we're going to cover Wi-Fi design fundamentals. We'll look at antennas, RF power, roaming, and some new Wi-Fi technologies. We're going to cover two of them. First is 802.11ax and second is WPA3. When you hear the word Wi-Fi, what comes to most people's mind is wireless technologies. So specifically wireless technologies that enable internet connectivity. And that's correct. That's one way to look at Wi-Fi. But if you look at it a bit more technically, Wi-Fi is a word that summarizes a lot of IEEE 802.11 wireless standards. There are about 40 of those standards at the time of this writing, and we're going to cover a lot of those standards in this course, but we will not cover everything. Now, IEEE is not the only body that um, is responsible for setting the rules and regulations on how Wi-Fi should work. There are other organizations like ITF, the FCC, and Wi-Fi Alliance that play very important roles. ITF will be focused more on internet standards, FCC will be focused on frequency allocation and management, and the Wi-Fi Alliance will be focused more on interoperability between the various vendors that make Wi-Fi equipment. Now this slide kind of summarizes what I said earlier. So ITF is a standards body for the internet, FCC will focus on frequency allocation and governance in the USA, um, and FCC um, would be the European equivalent for FCC. Now, Wi-Fi Alliance focuses on promoting Wi-Fi equipment interoperability. Now we're going to talk about frequency bands. So in Wi-Fi, there are two main frequency bands. You have your 2.4 gigs and the 5 gigahertz. Now 2.4 gigahertz is used by 802.11a, b, g, n, and ax. And in 2.4 gigahertz band, there are 14 channels. Now each channel is 20 megahertz wide and each channel is separated by 5 megahertz. So if you plot um, the 2.4 gigahertz frequency band in a diagram form, you have something as follows. So you would see, I have here, I have 14 different channels. So this is channel 1, we have channel 2, channel 3, and so on and so forth, all the way to channel 14. And you can see the separation between the different channels is 5 gigahertz wide, right? So that's this. Now, when you plot this diagram, you realize that we only have three channels that are non-overlapping. So that will be 1, 6, and 11, which is why when you look at 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi networks, you would see that the channels you would most likely see in use will be 1, 6, and 11. In 5 gigahertz, we have a lot more channels. Now, 2.4 gigahertz, we have only 14. In 5 gigahertz, we have up to 135. In some cases, as low as 36, but 36 is still a lot more than 14. Um, there are different types of 5 gigahertz bands, which is why we have a variation or a range of channels for 5 gigahertz. Now, 5 gigahertz will be used in 802.11a, n, ac, and ax, so in a lot of the newer standards. Now, the channel is also a lot wider, which is why we have better throughput. We have a 40 megahertz channel. We also have an 80 megahertz channel. Now, if you're using 80 megahertz, you need to use that band wisely because you're going to get a higher bandwidth, but you could also have congestion if you don't design the network properly um, due to the fewer non-overlapping channels. Now, you can actually see what type of um, wireless network or Wi-Fi network you're using by pressing the option button on your MacBook and hitting the wireless icon on the top right of your screen. When you do that, you'll see something like this. So here on my home network, I'm using WPA2, which has its own security issues that I'll be covering later in this video. And I'll probably make um, an entire um, series of videos that shows how you can actually cause some disruption on Wi-Fi networks that run WPA2. But anyway, I use WPA2 um, I'm connected at 5 gigahertz frequency band. The width of the channel I'm connected to is 40 megahertz, and this is the number of the channel, so channel 44. Um, 
My receive signal is minus 50. We're going to cover that in um, the later part of this course. You can see my TX rate is 270 megabits per second. This is perfectly fine for me because I only have about the 100 megs um, up and down to my ISP. So it's okay to connect that to 70 megs on my home network. And I'm using 802.11n Wi-Fi standard, right? So next we'll talk about five gigahertz channel bonding. So channel bonding effectively treats adjacent 40 or 80 megahertz channels as a single channel. And the goal is to provide more bandwidth and to have a higher throughput. Now, channel bonding is supported in 802.11n and later. So even though I have um, 802.11a support for five gigahertz, I do not support channel bonding in 802.11a. Um, it has to be 802.11n, AC, or AX. In theory, you could actually bond 2.4 gigahertz channels, but in practice, you will not really get much value from that because you have only three non-overlapping channels. So now let's look at the various standards that I've been talking about. I've talked about A, I've talked about B, G, N. I've talked about all these standards, but let's look at some of the important properties in more detail. So 802.11 is a data standard that supports up to one megabits per second. So this would be the original or the first 802.11 standard. Um, it runs only on 2.4 gigahertz. And then after that, we had 802.11b, um, which supports up to 11 Mbps and runs only on 2.4 gigahertz. And then we had 802.11a, which runs supports up to 54 megabits per second and runs only on five gigahertz frequency band and then G supports up to 54 megabits per second and runs only on 2.4 gig. Now 802.11n is the standard I use, it supports up to 600 megabits per second and could work on 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz band. Now AC um, runs, supports up to 6.9 gigabits per second, it's also known as Wi-Fi 5 um, and runs only on 5 gigahertz band and then 802.11ax, which we'll be covering in more detail in the later part of this course, um, supports up to 9.6 gigabits per second throughput and could run on 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz bands. So these are the data standards, the most common data standards that you need to know when it comes to Wi-Fi. Now, there are some other standards like 802.11h that provide two important capabilities. The first is DFS, right? So this is dynamic frequency selection. Now, there are certain 5 GHz bands that are used by radar or satellite systems. And DFS, defined in 802.11h, mandates that a wireless de device detect that radar system and switch to a different channel. Now, a lot of vendors support 802.11h DFS capability, but some vendors don't. And those vendors that do not support DFS simply disable the use of those 5 GHz bands that are used by radar or satellite systems. Now, the second thing that 802.11h standard gives us is TPC or transmit power control. Now this allows a Wi-Fi device to negotiate and keep power at a certain level that is good enough for communication but prevents interference at the same time. So effectively TPC allows Wi-Fi devices listen before transmitting so that they can adjust their transmit power and channels appropriately. Another standard is the 802.11e or Wi-Fi QoS. So this is a standard that provides differentiated service for latency-sensitive latency applications like voice and video. Other standards include the 802.11k, which is a radio measurement standard, and 802.11r, which is the roaming standard. Now we'll talk about that in subsequent slides. Now we're going to look at some interoperability standards. So Wi-Fi Alliance, as I said earlier, is focused on interoperability amongst Wi-Fi vendors. And there are several um, standards that the Wi-Fi Alliance provides. So the first is WPA, WPA2, and WPA3, which we're going to be covering in more detail in subsequent slides. Um, Wi-Fi Alliance also um, provides WMM, um, which is the QoS standard for voice and video traffic. So let's talk about Wi-Fi design fundamentals. When designing Wi-Fi networks, there are two things you need to bear in mind. The first thing is, you need to ask yourself, am I designing for coverage or am I designing for capacity? When you've been able to answer that, those questions, that would influence the type of access points you select, the quantity of those access points, 
how you deploy and configure those access points. This is an example of a coverage-based design for a single floor. In the coverage-based design, you have fewer access points, but those access points will be set to a much higher transmit power compared to a throughput focus design. As you can see here, the circles are really large. That's to denote the high transmit power. And we still want to make sure that adjacent channels do not overlap, which is why I have one here, I have six, and then I have 11. 11 does not overlap with one, one does not overlap with 11, 11 does not overlap with six. So this is 2.4 gigahertz band example. Now, this is an example of a throughput focus design. So the same surface area, but you can see I have a lot more access points so I can get much better throughput. And I am reducing my transmit power compared to a coverage based design. And I still want to, as much as possible, make sure that adjacent channels do not overlap. Now, there are some challenges that you need to bear in mind when designing Wi-Fi networks. The, the most important, important one is interference, right? Common sources of interference include other 802.11 networks that use the same unlicensed frequencies. Remember, the 2.4 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz frequencies that we use in Wi-Fi are unlicensed, which means that um, if you're running Wi-Fi at home, your neighbor might be using the same frequencies, potentially the same channels, and so on and so forth. If you're running Wi-Fi in your office, the office adjacent to you or on the next floor may be using the same frequencies as you as well, right? So that's one common source of interference, other Wi-Fi networks. Another big source of interference would be Bluetooth devices and also microwave ovens. Now, these interference sources create noise, which in turn result in low throughput for end users due to their frequent need to retransmit. Now, in order to be able to detect these interference sources, you can use spectrum analyzers. So spectrum analyzers allow you to discover other 802.11 networks, what channels that are being used on those networks, and this will enable you to set your channel configuration appropriately. Now, if you're deploying Wi-Fi in an enterprise environment, you don't need to worry about this. You could use a wireless controller to automate this function. But if you're designing Wi-Fi for, say, an enterprise environment, then you need to pay attention to what are the different frequencies around you and what are the channels that are being used in those frequencies. Now, you also have some spectrum analyzers that can detect non-802.11 sources like Bluetooth, microwave, video security, video security cameras, and so on and so forth. So once you detect this 802.11, um, these non-802.11 noise sources, you can then eliminate them from, from that area if possible or you can move your access points far away from those sources. Now, another common design challenge is signal corruption. Now, once you transmit a radio frequency signal from a sender to a receiver, this signal can bounce off multiple surfaces before arriving at the receiver. This cr corrupts the signal, um, creates data loss, and results in the receiver requesting for data to be retransmitted. Right, so this is another thing you need to be aware of when designing Wi-Fi networks. What are the different surfaces around? What are the different walls? What's the different obstructions between um, the source and the receiver? So it's not just interference. You also need to consider the obstructions and the surfaces between receiver and sender. Now let's talk about antennas. We're going to look at the different types of antennas. Um, we'll look at antenna gain, coverage area. We'll look at installation and also signal propagation. So there are two main types of antennas. The first is the omnidirectional antenna, and the second is the directional antenna. So your omnidirectional antenna can send and receive a radio frequency signal at a 360 degree angle, while your directional antenna can send and receive radio frequency signal from a radius of about 45 to 90 degrees. Now, there are different types of omni antennas, and Typically, in the access points you'll be deploying at home or in your enterprises, those will be omnidirectional antennas. Those antennas could be high gain or low gain antennas. Your high gain antennas has better coverage on the vertical plane and poorer coverage on the horizontal plane. This means that if you're deploying um, an access point with a high gain omnidirectional antenna in a multi floor building, for example, um, that antenna or that access point will have much better coverage on the same floor compared to between floors. So let's look at this diagram. You see this is floor one, floor two, floor three. I have an access point in floor two. Um, if that access point is a high gain omni, you're gonna have great coverage in floor two, 
but you're going to have minimal coverage in floor three and floor one. If that antenna on this access point is a low gain omni, you're going to have better coverage between floors and poorer coverage on the same floor. Now let's talk about how we actually mount antennas. So we mount antennas either on the ceiling, so on the ceiling will be the most common way. And if you put the antenna on the, ce on the ceiling, this is how the signal gets radiated. This is like a depiction of the radiation pattern. Now in some cases, you may not be able to um, deploy the antenna on the ceiling. So you can deploy it on a wall or on a pole. Um, and if you deploy antenna, say on the wall, fixed, mounted to the wall, um, the radiation pattern would be from left to right in this manner. And in some cases, you may not even be able to deploy it on the wall or on the ceiling, and you might want to keep it on the floor. So in that case, the radiation pattern will be the opposite of when you deploy it on the ceiling. So you're going to send most of your signal this way all the way up, right? So these are the different mounting options when um, trying to deploy an access point. Now, there's no benefit of one over the other. I'll say typically you will see most people deploy on the ceiling in an office environment. If it's a home network, you're going to be deploying on the floor um, or on the side. Um, so it depends on the environment. It depends on you know the various physical constraints that you have. Now, let's talk about single input, single output, and multiple input, multiple output. Now, if you look at a lot of the access points that you have on the market today, a lot of them would be talking about multi-user MIMO. Um, you will hardly see single input, single input, single output in uh, access points of today. That's because single input, single output was used by a lot of legacy Wi-Fi technologies. So in single input, single output, one antenna is responsible for transmitting or receiving at a time. Whereas in the newer 802.11 network, such as 802.11n, AC, or AX, um, you can send and process multiple data streams from multiple users using your antennas, right? So this gives you much better throughput. And typically, those access points will have multiple antennas in them as well. So now we're going to talk about TX power. The TX power of an access point determines the coverage and the signal quality of the access point. It can be measured in milliwatts or dBm. dBm means decibel relative to milliwatt. So zero dBm will be equals to one milliwatt. So milliwatt is a linear scale, while dBm is a logarithmic scale. So Wi-Fi is a logarithmic phenomenon, so it makes sense to use dBm, and you will see that in most cases that most people would measure um, TX power in dBm. Now when looking at TX power, there's an important rule to remember. It's called the rules of tens and threes. So if you have a three dBm power increase, this means you're gonna have a two X power increase in milliwatts. If you also have a 10 dBm power increase, this means you have a 10 X power increase in milliwatts. And the same goes in reverse. So if you wanna increase um, the TX power by 10 X, you need to get a gain of 10 dBm. Right? If you want to increase um, the TX power by 2X, you need to get a gain of 3 dBm. So a common transmit power setting on most access points will be 20 dBm. However, you really want to set your TX power such that as you test your coverage or your signal quality in your deployment, the maximum you get on the receiver side is minus 67 dBm. Right, if you start to get more than minus 67, that's very poor signal quality. Generally, you want to be at that minus 67 dBm limit. So the closer you are to access point, the better your signal coverage will be. But the farther you get away from the access point, the poorer the signal coverage is. And you generally don't want any location in that coverage area that your deployment encompasses. You generally don't want to go below minus 67 dBm. So there's another important phenomenon that we need to talk about when considering TX power. It's called the effective isotropic radiated power. So this determines the maximum output of an access point. So how do we calculate this? So that's a function of the TX power of the access point, any cabling or connector attenuation, and also an antenna gain. So in this case, I have a TX power set to 20 dBm. I have some connectors, 
and some cabling. In this case, I'm assuming an eight meter cable. Um, so the total loss in that case would be minus 4.2 um, dB. And then I have an antenna gain of about 12 dBm. So the way I get the effective isotropic radiated power or the maximum output for that access point is I take 20, um, I subtract 4.2 from 20, and then I add that to the result of that to 12. Right, so if I subtract 20 from, um, if I subtract 4.2 from 20, that would give me 15.8, and then I could have, round that off to about 16, and then I can add 12 to that, that's 28. So the EIRP in this case will be about 28 dBm. So this is a typo, it should be 28 dBm. Right, so let's talk about roaming. Now, at the most fundamental level, when we think about roaming, we want to be able to take our mobile device, either our phone or our laptop, move around the office or around the house, have a video call or a conference call and not get dropped off or not lose any packets, right? So that's roaming at a very high level. Now, in order to understand how that works in, say, an enterprise environment, for example, there are certain concepts we need to understand. The first is BSS. So BSS stands for Basic Service Set. This is just a group of access points and clients connected to that access point. That access point has a MAC address, also known as the BSS ID. We also have the idea or the concept of SSID. So the SSID is the name of the Wi-Fi network, right? We also call it extended service set. So this includes all APs broadcasting that SSID and all clients. So all APs and all clients associated with that logical name will be called SSID. Now, your SSID has a MAC address, and this MAC address will be derived from the AP's BSS ID. Now, when you talk about roaming, we need to remember that it's the client that decides to switch from one AP to another. It's not the APs, it's not the controller. The client makes that decision and says, okay, I'm moving from one location to another. I need to switch to another access point. Now, how it makes that decision depends on a variety of factors, right? One factor is the receive power. So how much power am I receiving from an access point? If the power gets too weak, then I need to move to another access point that has a much better power. So there's a standard called the 802.11R. So the 802.11R um, enables a client roam from AP to AP using a feature called the Fast Basic Service Set Transition or the FT, right? So this enables the client speed up the authentication when trying to authenticate to the new access point that has a much better um, receive power from the client perspective. Now, there are other standards like the 802.11v. So in this case, the wireless controller says, this is the amount of load that all these access points have. I want you to use that load information. So load in this case will mean the clients connected to those access points. I want you to use this load information and also the receive power information to make a decision on which access point you want to actually roam to. Another um, standard when it comes to Wi-Fi roaming is 802.11k. So this provides another optimization that enables client build a list of all the nearby access points and all the and all their signal strength, and this will enable it facilitate a quick selection of the next best access point when moving from one location to another location. So finally, I'm going to talk about some new Wi-Fi technologies. We're going to look at 802.11ax and we're going to look at WPA3. So 802.11ax is also known as Wi-Fi 6. This is the successor to 802.11ac, also known as Wi-Fi 5. And 802.11ac was the successor for 802.11n, which I'm running in my home. Now, it supports a much higher throughput, so 802.11ax will support a much higher throughput compared to 802.11ac. And the reason it does this is due to a much higher order QAM modulation. It also supports better range and better coverage area compared to 802.11ac because it supports 2.4 GHz as well. Now, 802.11ac would only support 5 GHz frequency band and 2.4 GHz is supported by 802.11ax and we know that 2.4 GHz travels a lot farther than 5 GHz. Now, the second technology I want to talk about is WPA3. 
Now, most networks you will see running in enterprises or even at homes, we either run WPA um, personal, WPA2 personal or WPA2 enterprise. Now, WPA3 is um, an upgraded version, right? It's, it's a much more secure version when you're looking at um, security for your Wi-Fi networks. Um, it solves a lot of the problems that WPA2 um, and its predecessors has. And one important one is the authentication attacks. Now, I actually um, simulated a authentication attack on my home network um, a couple of weeks ago, and I'll probably make a video and put that online at some point. But it's a way you can actually piece off people, users on the network and cause um, users on the network to get de-authenticated to, to the, from the access point. And the, the reason this is possible with... Um, um, WPA2 is because WPA2 does not authenticate, I mean, does not encrypt, I should say, the management frames. So an attacker can capture the management frames and send dissociation signals to various clients on the network, right? And apart from just piecing users off on the Wi-Fi network, um, it's a way to actually be create more, to actually implement more sophisticated attacks. So you could implement some kind of man-in-the-middle attacks um, as a successor to your authentication attack. So with WPA3, it's mandatory to implement management frame encryption. Now, the second benefit of WPA3 is, compared to say other appreciated key-based Wi-Fi networks, is it uses simultaneous authentication of equals. Now, SAE provides immunity to dictionary attacks, either passive or active dictionary attacks. Now, that thing with WPA3, to enterprise version is there are so many security options, so many algorithms, and some of these you know various algorithms for hashing and encryption are inherently insecure, right? So if you choose the wrong option, you could make your Wi-Fi network less secure. Now with WPA3, um, they say mandatory cipher suit and a set of rules, and that's what you have to use. So it's fewer options, um, less chances of configuring the wrong thing. And finally, you have Another thing that WPA3 does well is providing opportunistic wireless encryption. So instead of using your open Wi-Fi, which does not encrypt um, all wireless traffic, with WPA3, you could use opportunistic wireless encryption to encrypt every traffic on your Wi-Fi network. So that's the end of this course. I hope you found it useful. If you want me to make more theoretical or more practical based um, Wi-Fi videos, leave a comment in the description. Um, or if there's any topic in general you want me to cover on this channel, leave a comment in the description. Remember to like, subscribe, and share with anyone that may be interested in this type of content. Thank you very much.